Praise the Lord, everyone. It is good to be in the house of the Lord tonight. I mean, for me, it is good to be in the house of the Lord tonight. Prophet Micah, a very familiar passage of scripture I was thinking today, says, Rejoice not against me, O my enemy. When I fall, I shall arise. When I sit in darkness, the Lord shall be a light unto me. In order for us to arise, it takes a fall. In order for us to have to really see the light of Jesus, we have to be in darkness. There's an old statement that says familiarity breeds contempt. Probably a better word for contempt in our modern language would be apathy. Familiarity breeds apathy or just common. It becomes common. And I'm convinced, I said this before, and my ordeal over the weekend reminded me that sometimes we take things so much for granted, we really lose our appreciation of simple things. Um, <laughs> as I lay on my bed and writhed in pain, I don't know if any of you have ever had a kidney stone before, but uh, this is my second go-around. Brother Grant, he's the old pro. This guy is... Wow, he's had many, many, but this was my second go around, and I'll vividly remember the first go around, which has been a couple of decades ago. And I knew what to expect. I knew it was going to be painful. We had some pretty hard drugs because I had just had some oral dentistry done, and so I just immediately hit some hard drugs and thought, we're going to ride this out. And even with the hard drugs, it's some of the worst pain I've ever endured in my life. And I told my wife afterward, because you have a lot of time. It took seven hours for me to pass that into my bladder. And so for seven hours, you're dealing with this excruciating pain. And it's not constant. It's this ride up and down. You have these reprieves of where the pain is probably about a two to a three. And then I told my wife, I said, it's not the worst pain. I said, I can imagine there's things that is much more. But it's so long. And it just, you cannot escape it. Imagine some, being at an eight or a nine for... 20 30 minutes on end and there's nothing you can do to escape it and as i lay there and this is the whole reason this is not to draw attention to this i was thinking to myself brother grant what i would just give right now for nothing more than just to be pain free i don't want anything else i you know how in life sometimes it's like oh i don't want to eat that i don't want to eat that i we're so picky about things Brothers and sisters, I'm convinced that's why we have the ups and downs that we do in life. It's that contrast of light and darkness that causes us to appreciate the good. When the bad, when we've dealt with the bad, it, it causes us to appreciate some of those smaller things in life. And I'm just, I am grateful to be in the house of the Lord tonight. I am grateful to be pain free right now. I, I'm not, uh, I'm not sitting here coveting other things. I'm just grateful for the goodness of God. And it made me take a second look at just how blessed that I am just to know the Lord, to live in the land uh, in America where it, we have this freedom to worship the Lord. I was reading some reports this past week from missionaries uh, in the country of Vietnam where they're not allowed to just freely and openly gather and worship. Brothers and sisters, we have so many things to be so grateful and thankful for. I wonder as we open this service tonight, if you just stand to your feet with me, maybe if you feel like lifting your hands, would you just thank the Lord for His goodness? I don't know what God's done for you, but I know He's been good to me. He's been so faithful. He's been so kind. Even when I've been unfaithful, He remains ever faithful. Lord, I'm grateful tonight for your many good goodnesses, your blessings, Lord, that you pour out each and every day. You load us with blessings, the psalmist said. I stand here grateful today, God, unworthy of your many blessings, unworthy of your faithfulness, but God, you remain true. You remain loving. You remain kind and gentle. All of those things 
things, God. Those are your character, and that's who you are every single day, every moment, and in every situation, God. You've been kind. You've been faithful. You've been gentle. You've been so loving and so joy-filling in my life, and I thank you for it today. Thank you for the privilege to be in your house, in your presence, Lord, to lift up my hands and worship you, to lift up my voice and worship you. I thank you for that blessing today, God. I don't want to take it for granted and I want to exercise that privilege and right with abandonment, worshiping you. I bless you and praise you. Let's worship the Lord together with a renewed sense of appreciation and gratefulness today.
child from hurting like this and then I feel like I'm questioning the Lord so I'm like well Lord maybe you've got a greater purpose maybe Lord you need me to feel this so that I can empathize with somebody else after about four hours I said Lord I think I've suffered long enough I can empathize I don't need to keep this going <laughs> I just all of these conversations this time I had complication with keeping fluids down and so I was even everything back up and if you know me I absolutely hate to vomit I will actually hold it in and suffer generally so I can pass it because I just I hate to vomit I lose my breath and all of that I was laying there in writhing pain on the bed and I'm like Lord I'll leave I bargained with the Lord I'm like if you don't stop the pain strangely enough when I would vomit it would stop the pain of the kidney stone and I said Lord I'll right now I've been in pain so long I'll take a break just by some vomiting and literally within a minute the Lord answered that prayer and after that I was laying on the bed smiles hurting like crazy smiling in my head I'm like Lord you answered that prayer and you could take the pain away I don't understand but he knows what's best for me, brothers and sisters. I know that's a trivial, may seem trivial to you. I not laugh about it right now, but while I was smiling, I was in some serious pain, y'all. But that's the way it is in life. When I walk away from it all, looking back on it, I still trust him. He knows what's best for me. He's got a reason for everything that you and I go through in life. And this is the thing that kept me through it all. I knew I wasn't dying. And I was like, God, I'm in your hands. And when I look back on it all, I was like, God, you just gave me the grace. Even though maybe you didn't soften the blow, you didn't take the pain away, you gave me the grace to endure. Brothers and sisters, I don't care what you're going through in life, what you face, what you ever face in life. God's got this. The psalmist said, all of my days, and I reminded him of that laying on that bed. I'm like, God, you wrote this day in your book. That's pretty twisted. That's pretty crazy. I can't believe you put it in there. We could have skipped this chapter, but there's another chapter to be written, brothers and sisters, and I'm going to leave the pen in the greatest author's hand. Trust the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not to thine own understanding, but in all of thy ways, the painful, the dark, the valleys, trust him, and he's going to bring his will to pass. Fellowship with one another for a few moments. God bless you. Pastor's going to be bringing the word.
Well, praise God, everybody. It's good to be in the house of the Lord today. It's always good to be in the house of God. It's good to be in the house of God with the family of God. Amen. This is one of my favorite places. Um, no, it is. It probably is my favorite place. I love to be at home, but I find other things to do at home that get me busy. And, and uh, I come here and I do find things to do here, but something about being here and uh, being in the presence of God. Why don't you stand with me? Let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask him to open our hearts and our minds today. We need the mind of Christ. Uh, the, uh, the natural mind cannot comprehend the things of the spirit. And unfortunately, unfortunately, a lot of times we come from all different walks of life and our minds are scattered every which direction. I could hear worship going. I, I love both of those songs. And so I, I didn't get to be in here for worship. So maybe I just need to pray to get my mind. So would you all pray for me? Thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you for the opportunity we have to come together and worship in your house of worship, to receive from you and to give you back our worship, our, our praise, and God, just to magnify your name, and to be instructed in righteousness and to receive from your word what you would have us, oh God. Let your word be manifest today. Let, it, let God it find good ground in our heart. Help me today to... To speak according to your words. Let me speak only the things that you want me to say today, Lord. Put a guard upon my lips. And God, expand my mind with your mind. Let your mind be in us. Let us receive the word of God and empower us today. Oh God, we pray with your mind and your spirit. And everyone said amen. 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 God bless you. You may be seated. It's good to be with you tonight. It's always good, as I said, to be in the house of the Lord. Um. Uh, these uh, Wednesday night Bible study, I, I really, I enjoy Sundays, but this is where we grow. You want to get, well, I don't know if I should say it that way. Um, it might be easier to pray through on Sunday. So I was going to say, if you want to get saved, get here on Sunday. If you want to stay saved, be here Wednesday. Amen. Uh, this is uh, where we talk about life and uh, the purpose of the born-again believer. Uh, we, do, we will be teaching doctrine periodically, um, the fundamental doctrine of uh, New Testament salvation, but a lot of Wednesdays are how to grow, how to be who God called us to be, because we do realize that God filled us with the baptism of the Holy Ghost more than just to save us, right? Amen. Uh, he said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And the only way I can seek first the kingdom of God is if I am, transfer I am transformed out of who I normally, naturally am into who he's called me to be. I'm enabled by grace. And um, so I want to talk to you. I want to continue on today. Man, I wish I could just go back and start all over on this lesson. I went back and I read through it. And woo. I was like, man, I, I don't know if I hit, I don't know if we covered that enough, but I, I'm just going to keep on, and maybe sometime later on I'll come back and talk about this. This uh, Did my notes come through up there? I hope, yes, praise God. I want to continue on this subject of the catalyst for ministry. Catalyst for ministry. Because if you're born again, you have a ministry. You're a minister. You realize that, Correct. Uh, in this church, we have a motto, every member is a minister. Every member, a minister. Uh, what, is your, what is your first and primary uh, ministry if you're a born-again believer? Reconciliation. Reconciliation. Of course, we're worshipers, uh, but our ministry to the world is a ministry of reconciliation. Uh, you do realize that that's only enabled by the power of the Holy Ghost, Correct. We started this in the spirit, and so we have to continue it in the spirit. And the only way to minister it is by the spirit. However, um, there is a catalyst for ministry that we've talked about. Uh, everybody wants to be anointed, right? Everybody wants to operate in the gifts of the spirit. It's a great thing to, uh, to aspire to. 
But Paul told us in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 1, he said, follow after charity. And then desire spiritual gifts. But that word follow means to diligently seek after and pursue with everything within you. And he said, and then desire, as you go along following charity, desire spiritual gifts. So the most important thing in our life is to desire to be conformed into the image of, of Jesus Christ. It's amazing. He said, follow after charity. And then we find out later on, John writes, God is love. And so what we are following after is to be conformed into the image of Jesus Christ. So Matthew chapter 22, and we'll do a, a, just go back and touch a little bit um, on, on where we left off. Uh, catalyst for ministry. Anybody? What's the catalyst for ministry? Love. It's got to be love. And I wanted to get to 1 Corinthians chapter 13 tonight. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. Um, I feel like there's some things I need to talk to you about. The Holy Ghost has been dealing with me for uh, the past couple of weeks about, about this subject. It's, it's continuing in the catalyst for ministry. Uh, but we do realize that this, these Wednesday services are more than just a social gathering, correct? We realize that we come here to receive direction for life. H how do I live a life better for the Lord Jesus? I want to be effective. I said I want to be effective. The, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. I want to be effective. I want to avail much in my life. It's, it's not because I, I'm proud of who I am, but I'm grateful for what he's done. And I want him to get a, a return on his investment in me. And me just going to heaven is not a return on his investment. But it's who I can help make it to heaven. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. There's more to go along when it's just getting to heaven. His righteousness. And his righteousness is a, a, the transformation of you and I from who we are naturally. Do you know you have a natural tendency? You have a natural character? You probably got it from, you, you probably see similarities uh, in, your, in your fathers, your mothers, your, uh, your family. Okay? Ex exactly. Generational tendencies, characteristics. Some good, <laughs> probably some bad. The most wonderful thing about the baptism of the Holy Ghost is, Mackenzie, you don't have to be like me. <laughs> and Drew says, thank God. Because now we have, a, we have a natural tendency. We have a natural man. But the scripture says we are partakers of a divine nature. I don't know about you, but I am so grateful that I don't have to be who I naturally am. I'm so thankful for the power of the Holy Ghost, the power of grace that transforms me out of who I naturally am into who he wants me to be. I am being conformed. Everyone say conformed. Conformed into the image of Jesus Christ. That conforming is a forming. It's a pressure. We don't like pressure, do we? But you know what? I see God allowing situations arise in my life that reveal to me. You ever think, man, I'm not such a bad guy or gal. Okay, the rest of you are way ahead of me. There's sometimes I look in the mirror and I say, you know what? God's really done a good work in you. You're not, you're not so bad after all. And then all of a sudden I get in the word of the, of the, I get in the scripture, you know, that perfect mirror. And I'm like, Oh, my word, I'm having a bad hair day. Something happens in life that reveals to me who I really am. I thought I was doing so good. To him that thinks he stands, the scripture says, take heed lest you fall. And so uh, the more I ask God to make me in his image, you know, we sing that song, make me in your image. 
wash me white as snow. We, we like that part. But that first part, whew, that making is a conforming. And it's a change. You do, you and I have to realize, we are going to have to change from the moment he baptizes us with his spirit until that great change. And in between, there is no arrival. There's no place where we can say, whew, I finally made it. I told Bishop some time back, I said, the more I study and I learn about God, the more ignorant I realize I am. So they came to Jesus and they said, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Page five. And Jesus said unto them, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. But he noticed he didn't leave them there. They said, what's the great commandment? He gave them the great commandment. He said, hey, while we're here, I want to give you another one. The second is likened to it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Now, quickly, let me just do a little Bible study on the word love. Now, I know you know about the three kinds of, uh, of, of, of love that are uh, described in the Greek. But... This, this word, thou shalt love the Lord thy God, here in Matthew 22, it's agapeo, not agape, it's agapeo. It's to love much in a social or moral sense, very much related to filio, to be a friend of, to be fond of, to have an affection for, denoting a personal attachment as a matter of sentiment or feeling. However, agapeo is wider. It embraces essentially the judgment and the deliberate assent of the will as a matter of principle, duty, and proprietary. The two are very much related. The one based off of a feeling. The other one bases off of a knowledge. I have an understanding. How many of you know God's been good to you? And so I tell myself, you know what? God's loved me. I need to love God back. That is, that is this agapeo. What happened to agape? Well, you have to realize they came back and they asked him, what is the first law? In, in quick Bible study, the New Testament is mostly Greek. Whenever you look up words in the New Testament, it's going to be mostly Greek. In the Old Testament, it's Hebrew. And those words don't mean the same. We've talked about grace. In the Old Testament, it's the favor of God. In the New Testament, it's the divine influence upon the heart and the reflection of it in the life. So it, it, it means, I think as Bishop said, that the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed or expanded upon. And so this love, you have to understand, the Holy Ghost wasn't yet given. So the love of God wasn't shed abroad in our hearts. And so the only thing they could do, he told them, he commanded them, you've got to love me as much as humanly possible. That was the Old Testament. The word in Deuteronomy 6 and 5 is ahabe, to have affection for, to love like as a friend. That's all they could do back in that day because they didn't know any better. But 1 John chapter 4 and verse 19 tells us now, he, realize he's talking to the church. He's talking to the born-again believer. Is it Romans 5 and 5? The love of God is shed abroad in our heart by the Holy Ghost. Now we have a, a new capacity to love. We have a capacity, thanks to grace, that goes beyond the natural affection of the human body. And so now he says, we love him because he first loved us. So now it's a reciprocal love. It's a love of God that was shed abroad in our heart. And we love him because he first loved us. Now, now let's jump back to, to John, his gospel. And he says, Jesus is talking in verse 13. 34 of chapter 13 he said a new commandment i give to you that you love one another as i have loved you notice he said as i have loved you 
and that you also love one another. They didn't really understand this quite yet because they didn't have the baptism of the Holy Ghost yet. But John does as he's writing this because John's like 90 something years old writing the gospel. He's already been on the other side of Acts chapter 2. And he's writing with a revelation. And he said, ah, this is what the Lord Jesus meant. When he said, love one another as I have loved you. He said, this is a commandment that ye also love one another. By, all, by this shall all men know that you're my disciples. Not that you have the gifts of the Spirit operating in your life. Remember? Desire, desire spiritual gifts. But follow after, chase down, search out love. Because through the love of God is what other people are going to realize. Now that's a disciple of Christ. We love God because he first loved us. It's reciprocal in that it benefited us. So we choose to love him back. We love one another because we're commanded to love one another. Because sometimes that's not so beneficial. Just saying. God said, you'll love me because I loved you. But your brother or sister might not be so lovable. Just like you weren't lovable, but I loved you enough to come and give myself for you. Give everything that I had. Let me tell you what. The Lord Jesus gave everything that he could possibly human give in his love for you and I. Everything. I'll touch on it later when I'm talking about prayer someday. Watch this. He went further. Luke chapter 6, 35 through 38. He's not just telling us to love one another. He says, love ye your enemies and do good and lend, hoping for nothing again. And your reward shall be great. And you shall be the children of the highest, for he is kind unto the unthankful, unto the evil. Wow. That first part, you know, we could love your enemies, do good, and land hoping for nothing in return, and your reward shall be great. Well, God, I'm not really hoping for a great reward. I'd rather just not like that joker. But the next phrase is a clincher. And you shall be the children of the highest. So if I don't, Now, verse 36. Be ye therefore merciful. He's still talking about not your brother and sister, those on the outside. Be ye therefore merciful. I've taught a lot on grace, taught a lot on the mercies of God. But I feel a series coming on about the mercy of men. Be ye therefore merciful. As your Father also is merciful. Judge not. I said a few weeks ago, Most times what we are judging is a symptom of an underlying issue that happened long before you ever came on the scene. If I kick you in the shins, you probably hop around on one foot. That's a normal reaction. If if people obtain an injury somehow, whether it's Deliberate or accidental, there is a natural reaction to that action. And naturally, you can't blame people for hopping around on one foot when you've just barked their shins. Let me tell you something. This world does far more than bark our shins. And we see actions and we see behavior 
And we want to, sometimes, we want to judge by what we see and what we understand. It's not normal to hop around on one foot. God gave you two. Walk on them. It's much more effective to get from here to there walking on two feet rather than hopping on one. Why are you hopping on one? Put the other one down and walk. You understand what I'm saying. We see a person hopping on one foot and we're like, that's dumb. We see a person act in a certain manner and we say, well, that's not socially acceptable. We see a person act in a certain way, respond in a certain way, and we say, what's your problem? That's not normal behavior. You don't know what if it is or if it's not. You don't know where they've been. You don't know what they're going through. You don't know the pain that they're feeling. And it's easy for us to judge them from our perspective of that don't seem normal to us because we don't know the backstory. Could it possibly be that God puts you in their life because they have never been exposed to the mercy and the compassions of Almighty God? All they've ever done has been judged by normal reactions to what's happened in their life. And then when they face me, Elder, and they come into my life and they're acting goofy, I go ahead and I judge them because they're acting goofy. And all the time the Holy Ghost is saying, you know, if you just love them people, if you just wait a minute, maybe I'd give you a word of knowledge and you could minister to a cause instead of being upset with a symptom. You see, I think in this generation, do you realize that America is fast becoming non-Christian? You know, I think the church is to blame. I didn't say God. I said the church. God is misrepresented. God is love. Who wouldn't want to be around love? God is merciful. Who wouldn't want to be around mercy? God is generous. Who wouldn't want to be around generosity? God is kind. Who wouldn't want to be around kindness? God is forgiving and restoring. Who wouldn't want to be around that? Now, I realize that there are some people in this world that just, they don't want it. They're, for whatever reason. But I have found that the vast majority of people want to do what's right. They just don't know if it's possible. And Christianity, God is supposed to help us, right? Do you know when they see Jesus most active in our life? It's not when things are going good. Everybody can smile and everybody can have a good day and everybody can pat somebody on the back. And, you know, when everything's going good, Christmas time, I'll give you $5. I'm real generous. Little guy out there with the bell, ding a ling a ling a ling a ling a ling a ling. You walk up, you empty out all your change. And then you look around, make sure somebody's seeing you do it. But what about on the day that everything goes wrong? What about on the day when everything that could go wrong does go wrong? You know, Jesus had some of those days. There were days they tried to push him. I I was just reading the other day. They tried to push him off a cliff. Another day they tried to stone him.
Man, the garden, the crucifixion. I don't want to. I don't want to be blasphemous, but that's a bad day. What do you say, Father? Forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. On the cross, two thieves are railing, and all of a sudden, one of them gets a brain check. Please remember me when you come into your kingdom. Hanging there, suffering, agonizing, bad day. Agreed? That dude had just been cursing him because one of the gospels said, and they both. But all of a sudden, one of them got convicted. And in the midst of having a bad day, In the midst of his most agonizing moment on earth, he looks over and he says, it's all right. You're going to be with me in paradise today. That's the love of God. So you want to know when they see the love of God in your life, it's not when you just got a bonus. It's not when everything just went well. It's when life went to pieces and you were wronged. And you can bless and not revile. Pastor, why are you going here? Because ministry, and that's what we are, ministers of reconciliation, remember? That's not... That, that's not limited to good people. I'm sure Ananias would not have considered Paul a good person. Right? He stood consenting unto Stephen's death. Here's you something. You know why Paul had to consent for Stephen's death? Because Jews could not condemn someone and kill them without a Roman representative that gave consent. And Paul was a Roman. And Paul gave consent to the first martyr's death. He made it okay for them bunch of Jews, hypocritical Jews, to stone that man to death. You think Ananias didn't know about that? Because you're going to run into some Pauls. You're going to run into some people that aren't worthy of the love of God. Please remember that we weren't either. And if you're going to minister reconciliation to them... The only way you and I can do it is not in righteousness. Well, that's my righteous obligation. I've got to sow the seed. No. It's got to be in love. That's why when I pray the first, one of the first prayers I ask is, God, and do impart your burden. And you know what the burden of the Lord is? Compassion. The mercies. The burden of the Lord is the longing desire to reconcile man back to him. You know, I don't, norm, I don't naturally have that. Neither do you. That's why it's imperative that you and I pray, God, give me your burden. Because when they act like the world, I need to act like Not the world, but you. Right? Am I in left field? So you have to realize that this ministry of reconciliation has got to be bound in love. You've got to love everybody. You don't know who God's reaching to. I said, you don't know who God is reaching to. And you know who he's going to do it? You know who he's going to use to do it? You.
we come from all walks of life. I dare say, well, I know because I know you. I know me. There are all kinds of rotten people in this building before Christ. But you are washed. But there was a reconciliation that happened. Somebody ministered reconciliation to you. Me. The Lord brought me up short. He's done it twice lately. I'm scared to death of needles. And three nurses for daughters. They, Dad, can we practice on? No. No, no. Flunk that class. You are not practicing on me. I found out it's not the needles, the poke that I'm scared of. They say I've got really good veins, but they're deep. And I got rhinoceros skin. That's what they say. I don't. So it's really hard to get in there and find. The so anybody ever have an IV where they have to go digging? Oh. That helps make me sing soprano in the opera. I was already anxious. I was going in for my first chemo I, uh, infusion. And I didn't have a port yet. So they're going to have to do it intravenously. I already know I'm not a good stick. I'm anxious for chemotherapy. I'm anxious because I know these people usually just... Oh, let me, how many of you think ports are a great thing? Let me tell you what. The needle they use in a port, I've used smaller diameter nails to put trim in homes. It is better, but anyway. Most of the time, they just take this little thing and put it on this little triangle and push a button and pop, done. You've seen that before. But this time I know... This girl probably don't do this very often. And I'm a hard stick, and there's no crisis nurse around here, and there's no little machine. You know, they got these really cool sonogram machines. Is it sonogram machines? They can find your vein, and I learned this by experience. It, the nurse don't even look at my arm. He, he was watching a screen. There's the needle. There's your vein. Boop, right in. They didn't have one of those. She missed and she missed, and she missed, and she was looking for Moby Dick in my arm. She was fishing everywhere. And finally I said, okay, we're done. It wasn't what I said. It was how I said it. I was done. And she said, I am so sorry. She went and found another nurse. I, I, I'm taking too long to tell this story. <sighs> the other nurse came back and I said, no. Go get the other girl. I got something to do before you do this. She went and got her. I said, I have to apologize. I am so sorry. She said, oh, that's okay. She said, people will come in here like, I said, no, 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 it's not okay. I'm a minister. And I was so wrong. I ask you to forgive me. Try this arm. She got it first time. <laughs> There's nothing like having to go back and ask forgiveness. 
that will keep you constrained in the love of God. Oh, Pastor, why, why did you do that? You was legit. Bishop said something one time when I was young, and I've never forgotten this. I forget what the situation was about, but he asked a person after something like that had happened, he said, now, would you like to go back and ask them to come to church with you this coming Sunday? And in my mind, I thought, I could walk out of here, walk to the pulpit Sunday morning, and somebody is going to have invited that lady. <laughs> and she's going to sit in that seat and look at me I would have to walk out of that pulpit and get on my knees and ask her to forgive me before I could say a thing. Oh, Pastor, that don't happen. What's her name? Emily. She knows Mackenzie. She said, Lashley. She said, I went to school. She worked, on she worked in the hospital with her. She said, I think I know your daughter. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. I repented before I found this stuff out. Just being honest with you folks. If we are going to be ministers of reconciliation, we're going to have to do it not out of obligation, but out of love for him first and foremost, and out of a love for them. We're going to have to let that love of God constrain us. Oh, Jesus, I took way too much time talking about all that stuff. Well, in order to get to where I wanted to get, I did. Given it to be okay. Here you go. Judge, and you shall not be ju judge not, and you shall not be judged. Let me tell you what. You're going to need mercy at some point in your life. You're going to need it. You go ahead, fly off the handle. You go ahead and be your nasty old natural self. And when you need mercy the most, you're going to meet somebody just like you were. Judge not, and you should be not judged. Condemn not, and you should not be condemned. Forgive, and you shall be forgiven. Notice, this is in the future. You're going to need this stuff. I don't have time to go into the other lesson I learned this recently, but it was on judgment, judging. So watch. He's, in this context, give, and it shall be given unto you. Oh, I thought that was about tithing and offering. No, 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 no. No, this is about mercy, giving mercy, giving compassion, forgiving. Give and it shall be given unto you, good measure pressed down, shaken together and running over, shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure that you meet, uh, you, what goes around comes around. You was looking for a verse that would back that up. With what measure you meet or you give it out, with else shall it be measured to you again. I don't know about you, but I need mercy. I don't want anybody judging me. I got bad days too. So, prodigal son, real quick. I'm convinced that the reason the father watched for the prodigal and ran to him, kissed him, forgave him, restored him, and rejoiced over him a great way off was because he was afraid the elder brother would get to him first. God so loved the world that he gave us the ministry, the world, and he gave you and I the ministry of reconciliation. Reconcile the world unto himself. If you and I represent him, then we must be conformed into his image. This world must experience him when they experience us. Come on, are we looking for harvest and revival? Well, first we've got to have revival in ourself. Watch Acts chapter 3, verses 4 through 6. It's amazing how the Scripture just speak to you from Scriptures you've read many times and you're, something's going on in your head and you go, you're like, how, how does that, how, how does that 
have anything to do with this. But watch this. Acts chapter 3 and 6, the guy that uh, Peter and John are going to the temple, and the guy's lame, and, and he, he's asking an alm. And verse 4 of chapter 3, Peter, fastening his eyes upon him, Peter noticed a man that was hurt. He noticed a man that was lame. He noticed a man that was in need. You and I need to look at this world and not be revolted by what they look like. That was the, uh, what was it, the priest and, uh, and the Levite and the Good Samaritan. The guy, the guy that was laying there and they walked over, ooh, yuck. I don't want to get in that mess. Peter looked at him and he saw a man in need and he said, look on us. Why? Because I look like Jesus. I'm fixing to do what Jesus did. This guy is not going to benefit me at all. In fact, he's asking, so I'm in a hurry. I'm going someplace. I don't really have that much money. You remember the Lord had to send me fishing so I could pay my own taxes. It was a joke. I don't have that much money. In fact, he told him, he said, I don't have any silver or gold. I can't get bogged down here. Look upon us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. And Peter said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have. What do you have? He didn't have any gold. He didn't have any silver. I'll tell you what he had here in another, in just a second. Such as I have, give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise and walk. Acts chapter 4 and 13 tells us what he had. Now when they saw, talking about the Sanhedrin that brought James and, and Peter, Peter and John in, and they're, they're fitting to give them the third degree, but when they, saw, when they saw the boldness, now this is not the, I told you so, the arrogance, if you look that word up, boldness, it means open, sincere confidence. When they saw the boldness of Peter and John, they perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men. But they marveled, and that word marvel means they held in admiration. They didn't even like them, but they had to admire them because they took knowledge. They, had, they saw a mark. That's what, this, that's what that word means, they took knowledge. It's to know because of a mark, to recognize a characteristic. They took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. Oh, I wish somebody, when they saw me, would realize that man walks with Jesus. Uh, when I responded, when I talked to people, I don't want them to see Jeffrey. I don't want them to see a good person. I want them to see the love of God. Your ministry will flow out of a love. Colossians chapter 1 and 10. That you might walk worthy of the Lord. You walk, do you realize that we walk every day? You walk in human. I'm not talking about when you walk in this auditorium. I'm talking about whenever you're walking through the supermarket, when you're walking to the gas station, when you're walking in your neighborhood, when you're walking on the job, you walk in this world. And Paul said, walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. I would say all pleasing. Not just when we're going to talk religion. Being fruitful in every good work. And increasing in the knowledge of God. Strengthened with all might. According to his glorious power. Unto all. What? I thought we was going to say miracle signs and wonders here. Strength of the Almighty according to his glorious power unto, unto all patience and long suffering. How? Not I'm enduring this, but I'm, I'm joyous because not because you're acting like the world. But because I'm trying to act like Christ. And you just gave me the opportunity to act like him. Amen. 
strengthen, and long-suffering. Giving thanks unto the Father which made us meet to be partakers, partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and translate us in the kingdom of his dear son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. Second Corinthians chapter 5. All things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. He's given unto us a ministry of reconciliation. To it, God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, Oh, that's important. When people trespass against me, I'm really quick to let them know. Please don't shoot me. I know this hits us where we live. But listen, if we're going to be ministers of reconciliation, we're going to have to be ministers of love and mercy and grace. And we're going to have to be conformed into the image of Jesus Christ. And these situations that make me so mad are opportunities for him to conform me. And I promise you, everyone I fail, he'll give me a chance to make it up. Why? Not because he's mad, but because he's trying to conform me into his image so that I can operate in this ministry of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors, representatives of Christ. God did beseech you. We pray you in Christ did be reconciled to God. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 14, you are the light of the world. You know, people look naturally, they look at light. And there, it is dark, folks. I said, it is dark. I don't care who you are in the darkness. If you got a flashlight, I want to get close to you. Until I realize you're hunting me. Until I realize that you're caustic. You're the light of the world. I'm a Christian. It's a name I wear. No wonder Paul said, walk worthy of that name. Walk worthy of your vocation. It's not that God's mad at us. God's trying to use us. But the only way he can use us as ministers of reconciliation is if the world perceives us. Not how God perceives us. Not how your pastor perceives you. How does your coworker perceive you? How does your neighborhood perceive you? How does Facebook perceive you? It's a good thing they're not living on me and my subscriptions. I can't stand that thing. I know it's used for some good stuff, but my God, it spews more negativity. Too close to home? Okay, I'll back off. Use it to glorify God. They'll probably take you off. Oh, Brother Grant, it's a quarter after. I got to end this positive. I can't do it negative. You're the light of the world. City set on a hill can't be hid. Neither do men light a candle, put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick it gives light to all that are in a house. Let your light Let your light, let your light so shine before men that they may see. There's nothing good in me, Paul said. The only good that you see in me is Christ. But I want him to be so prevalent in my life that when people see me, they think that's who I am. They may see your good works. And glorify your Father which is in heaven. I think if people would really be exposed to who God was through God's people, there would be a whole lot more Christians. What was his name? The Indian philosopher Gandhi. He said if Christians were like to practice the religion and the doctrine of the Christ they say they serve, I would be one. 
I'm not trying to reprove us. I'm trying to tell you the responsibility that we have to walk in the love of God. After this manner, pray ye, therefore, our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. How's the name of Jesus going to be hallowed? Same way Paul said it was blasphemed. We wear it. Right? So here you go. Need a way to expand your prayer time? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And I realize the only way it's going to be hallowed in my realm of influence is if I walked worthy of that name. So hallow your name in this earth in my realm of influence by changing me and conforming me into your image. Thy kingdom come. That's his government. The government of God. Here's how I, I, I have five aspects where I pray this. Your kingdom come in me. Your kingdom come in my family, my home. Your kingdom come in my church. Your kingdom come in my realm of influence. And your kingdom come in my community. That'll take you a hot minute. You looking for ways to get linked in your prayer time? Get specific. Some of us are so general in our prayer, we won't know if God answers them or not. Your kingdom come. What's the kingdom of God? His authority. Kingdom. King is the root word. King of kings. Ruling in my life. Well, how does God rule in my life? Well, I speak in tongues. That don't mean nothing. Uh, my mother cast a devil out of a guy one time that was speaking in tongues under the influence of demonic power. Am I right? Guy that thought he had the Holy Ghost, he was trying to speak in tongue. Was it Nakaya? No, that was the devil. That was the devil that was in. Exactly. So, uh, what I'm trying to say is if we're truly in the kingdom of God, then his authority has to reign in our life. Pray, God, somehow take authority over this attitude, over this natural man. Your kingdom reign, your authority reign in my life. Change me from who I naturally am into who you've called me to be. Change me so that I can love with the love of God that you shed abroad in my heart by the Holy Ghost. Change me so that when I'm reviled, I revile not again. Change me so that I can love the way you loved. Change me, oh God, that I can be effective in the ministry of reconciliation. That only happens as the love of God pours through me. And if I'll let your authority reign in my life, then your will will be done in this piece of earth as you have decreed it in heaven. God, I, I ask you, Impart your burden into us. Help us to see humanity with your eyes. Help us see this lost world as valuable as you did. God, they reje rejected you. They reviled you. They persecuted you. They did their best to completely remove your existence. 
they tortured you, they maligned you, and then they killed everything that they possibly could. And yet you said, I, I still love them. They don't realize it. They're just reacting to a sin nature. But if I can bring them to a place of repentance and I can reveal myself to them, Paul won't be a murderer. He'll be an apostle. Matthew won't be a cheating publican. He'll be an apostle. Peter won't be a loud mouth brawler. He'll be a believer that steps up with the keys to the kingdom and preaches a keynote sermon on the day of Pentecost. Help me to see them with those eyes, God. Help me to love them with that love. Help me to see this world through your perspective and be a true minister of reconciliation so that your kingdom flourishes. And I am finally giving back. And I am being profitable to your kingdom. Oh, God, speak to us. Draw us close to you. Speak to us in our alone times. Give us God moments. And yes, God, conform us into your image so that you can flow through us and people look at us and see you. Be glorified in this church. Send revival and harvest to our community. We ask this in Jesus' name. Everyone say amen. Amen. I love you.